open your Bibles or turn on your devices, and we're looking at Acts chapter 9, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 9. Then we're going to move over to Philippians chapter 3, and we're going to look at the second half of verse 4 through verse 7. So that's Acts chapter 9, 1 through 9, Philippians 3, 4 through 7. If you're without a Bible, you can watch the screens behind me and follow along that way. Now, of course, we all know that today was that time change Sunday. I'm looking at my watch. It's just a little bit after 11. So for some people, that's a little bit after 10. So there will be some that you'll see wandering in. And then this is not a criticism. I'm just stating a fact. Some folks get here normally at about 1020, 1025, 1030. So they're going to be walking in maybe about 1130. I'm going to be wrapping it up, and they're going to think a miracle has taken place. <laughs> But let them know, no, you're going to just have to watch him online because he got here just a little bit late. But let's look at Acts chapter 9 as we continue our exploration of this amazing book. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by hand into Damascus for three days. He was blind and did not eat or drink anything. And then looking at Philippians chapter 3, we have Saul, also known as Paul, writing here. If anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. The Lord will bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. <clears throat> when you came in this morning, you should have received an index card. And if not, we can get those to you later. And we're going to do something with those at the end of our service this morning. Acts chapter 8 ends with the report. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about, pre and traveled about preaching the gospel to all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Having been greatly used in Samaria, the Lord directs Philip to go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. And on his way, Philip spots an, an important official from Ethiopia sitting in his chariot. The Holy Spirit tells Philip to approach the chariot. Philip runs to the Ethiopian. Once he's next to the chariot, he hears the man reading from the book of Isaiah. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. As a lamb before the shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. Philip tells the Ethiopian that everything he's reading about is about Jesus. And having heard the good news of Jesus, the Ethiopian surrenders his life to Christ. 
And with that, Philip is supernaturally transported to Azotus, where he continues to declare the good news of Jesus, which was what all the disciples of Christ were doing at this time. As we saw last week, a severe persecution against the church had broken out, and the Christians were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria, preaching God's word wherever they went. The church was growing. Their influence was expanding. The enemy's plot to destroy the church was failing. And while all this was happening, Satan's main operative, Saul, was breathing murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. That's how the Bible writes it. That while all this is happening, Saul was breathing murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. That's quite the picture. Breathing murderous threats. As if this man's main reason for living was a destruction of the church. Just get it. He was breathing. It, it, it gives that thought that every time he took a breath, all he could think of was destroying the church. Now, friends, where in the world did that sentiment come from? We know that what Saul was expressing had been birthed in his heart by the enemy, the devil. So we need to understand how much the devil hates the church. If Saul, if Saul, the Bible says, was breathing, every time he breathed out, there was a murderous threat against the disciples of Jesus. That was coming from the devil. That just gives us a little bit of a clue of how much the devil hates the church. And why does he hate the church? First of all, because he hates Jesus. And because he hates Jesus, of course he's going to hate his bride, the church. But secondly, I believe he hates the church because he knows what God can do through the church when the church is in perfect sync with the Spirit of God. And that causes him a threat. Friends, we need to understand who we are in Jesus. We need to see the church the way that Jesus sees the church. We need to pray. Come on now. We need to pray for the church the way Jesus intercedes for the church. We don't give up on the church. We pray. We stand with the church. We cooperate with the church. And we remain in sync with the Spirit of God. Satan had gotten his claws into this man and was using his willing hands, his zealous heart, and his brilliant mind against the church. Saul of Tarsus. Luke, the writer of Acts, gives him a passing glance when he reports the death of Stephen. In Acts 7, beginning at verse 54, we read that at the conclusion of Stephen's sermon, a sermon in which he glorifies Jesus and indicts the religious elite for their stiff-necked, stubborn, rebellious ways, that as he's coming to a conclusion, his audience is furious and rushes against Stephen. Then Luke tells us that Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looks up to heaven and declares, Look, I see heaven open, and I see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of the Father. Now listen to this. While he's being stoned to death, Stephen has the presence of mind to pray. Lord, receive my spirit and don't hold this sin against them. Who does that remind you of? Jesus. Stephen was following the pattern of Jesus all the way to his death. Stephen dies, becoming the church's first martyr. And I don't miss it. Stephen reports, I see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of the Father. 
Every other report that we have in the scriptures, every other revelation that we have in the word speaks about the Son of God, Jesus, sitting at the right hand of the Father. Sitting. Why? Because the work of redemption has been completed. But Stephen says, I see the Son of Man. I see the one who I've just been preaching about, and he is standing at the right hand of the Father. Why is he standing? My speculation. Because I believe Jesus was giving his choice servant, Stephen, a standing ovation and a welcome home. Friends, listen to me. We serve the Lord and we don't serve man. We don't work for the accolades of the world because they're very fleeting. We live, we work, we serve for the audience of one. So when you feel a little bit unappreciated by the world, grow up. Because we serve for an audience of one. For Jesus. We're not here to please people. We're not here to please the world. We're here to please Jesus. We're here to serve him. Always remember that. Back to the narrative. While this is happening with Stephen, Luke writes that those preparing to stone Stephen lay their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. Saul watched and heard everything that was happening. Not just that, Luke says he gave approval. He gave approval to Stephen's death. So let's put it all together. Persecution breaks out. The Christians scatter out from Jerusalem into Judea and Samaria, preaching Jesus wherever they go. People are being saved, baptized in the Holy Spirit, baptized in water, healed and delivered. The church is growing exponentially, its influence is expanding, and God's kingdom is advancing. In the meanwhile, Saul is making it his life's mission to put all of that to an end. Once and for all, he's going to destroy the church. He's going to destroy this movement. So you have two forces at work. You have Jesus and his church, and you have Satan, Saul, and his henchmen, and they're on a collision course, a collision course which at the point of impact will produce one of the greatest transformations recorded in the Bible. Saul embarks on a campaign of terror and murder against not vile, evil people who are polluting society with their morality, but against people who are known for their love of God and who delivered a message of hope, joy, and peace. So we have to ask the question, why does Saul hate Christians so much? Well, Saul was a leader among the Pharisees, the experts in the Old Testament law. And as far as Saul was concerned, he was doing God a service by getting rid of these followers of Jesus Christ. Saul knew Jesus as a leader of an ignorant band of fishermen, corrupt tax collectors, and, and pe people of questionable moral character. That's what Saul had heard. He had heard that Jesus' most severe messages were not pointed at open sinners, but they were pointed at people who thought themselves respectable, like Saul. Saul was looking for a Messiah, as were many of the Jews who would set up a physical kingdom and deliver Israel from Rome's oppression. But Jesus, this itinerant from Nazareth, preached a message of grace, forgiveness, mercy, joy, and peace. In Saul's theology, suffering indicated God's displeasure. Jesus was beaten, tortured, 
never defended himself. How could God be pleased with that? And what's more, he died the death of an accursed man. Saul could not wrap his mind around that. A deliverer, a Messiah, who was a cursed man. Well, friends, that's the gospel, isn't it? Jesus became accursed in order to remove the curse of sin from our lives. Jesus, the Messiah, the anointed one, the deliverer, the savior, lived a sinless life and then became sin so we might be called the righteousness of God. Jesus became accursed on the cross so that we might experience amazing blessing, abundant life here on earth, life with purpose, life with significance, with the promise of eternal life with him. Back to Saul. On top of all that he despised about Jesus and his followers, then Jesus' disciples insisted on preaching that he was resurrected from the dead. Impossible. Jesus was dead and buried. And Saul was determined to single-handedly put an end to the false hope and lies his followers were spreading. He would do it. He would snuff out the church. Or so he thought. Saul began his anti-Christian operation in Jerusalem. Then he set his sights on the neighboring provinces. And with that, Luke tells us, Saul goes to the high priest asked for extradition papers in order to bring back to Jerusalem any men and women who are following the Lord and bring them back from Damascus. Saul sets off for Damascus by foot. It's approximately a week-long journey. I have to wonder what Saul thought about as he traveled. Just maybe. He asked himself questions like these. These people, what motivates them to risk their lives? What is it about Jesus that has convinced them that he is the Messiah, the Deliverer? Why are there no reports of people renouncing their faith in him. The heat has been turned on. They're running everywhere, but everywhere they go, they keep talking about this Jesus. And Stephen, what possessed him to accuse the people of sin? of rebellion, what would possess him to make an accusation against the people who had the power to execute him? And then why? Why would he, with his final breaths, not make a plea for mercy from the executioners for him but instead he uses his final breaths to call out to God for mercy for the executioners for the act done against him. What's wrong with these people? None of this makes any sense. And dear ones, in an instant, <laughs> Saul's thoughts are interrupted. When a light from heaven flashes around him, Saul falls to the ground and he hears a voice. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It's hard for you. It's hard for you to kick against the goats. It is hard for you to kick against the cattle prods. 
Saul, being a good Jew, he knows you hear a voice from heaven, that's deity. He knows you hear a voice from heaven, that's God. So he asks the question, who are you, Lord? And then Jesus answers him, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Don't miss it, friends. Jesus asks, why are you persecuting me? And then when Saul asks, who are you? He answers, I'm Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Notice that? He doesn't say, I'm Jesus, the head of the church that you're persecuting. He doesn't say, I'm Jesus, the savior of the church that you're persecuting. Those are my people. I'm Jesus. Why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting me? Friends, do you see how intimately entwined Jesus is with the church? That when Saul asks who he is, he asks Saul a question, why are you persecuting me? Friends, we've got to remember that Jesus is intimately entwined with us. He is intimately entwined with his people. The fact that Saul addresses the voice as the Lord tells us that he knew he was dealing with deity. And as a Jew of Jews, he knew he was dealing with God. Jesus identifies himself and tells Saul to go to the city Damascus and wait there for further instructions. And Paul's response, he does what he's told. His traveling companions are speechless, the Bible says. Saul stands up, opens his eyes, but he can't see. He's been blinded. So his friends have to lead him to Damascus. Friends, until this moment, Saul was kicking against the cattle prods. He was pushing against God's plan in his life and God's plan for the church. He was rebellious and reluctant to move with God's purposes revealed in Jesus. He ignored the conviction of the Holy Spirit. He resisted Christ. After all, how could a Pharisee, he must have thought to himself, how could a Pharisee admit a need for grace, forgiveness, and help? But in that moment, on the road to Damascus, Saul knew. He knew that Jesus is the Messiah. He knew that Jesus is risen from the dead. He knew that Jesus identifies with the suffering of his people and that Stephen's testimony concerning Jesus, which he had heard, was confirmed. And the Bible tells us that Saul finally stopped kicking. He finally stopped resisting. Are you kicking against God's purposes today? If you are, you are living a miserable existence. You won't be happy. You will not be happy when you're kicking against the purposes of God. And if that's you this morning, perhaps you'll take Saul's lead today. Listen, listen. True Christianity is summed up in Acts 9-6. Now get up. Go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. That's true Christianity right there. Now get up, get into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Until that part, until that point, Saul did what he wanted to do when he wanted to do it. What he thought best his will dictated. But from this moment on, Saul would do only what Jesus told him. From this point on, Saul would do only what Jesus directed. You see, friends, this account, Acts chapter 9, this is not an account about sudden conversion. It's a report about sudden surrender. Surrender. You go to Damascus, he gets up, he goes to Damascus. It's an account of sudden surrender. The Christian, the true Christian, 
is that man or woman who does what Jesus Christ wants him or her to do, period. Listen, believers who change the world, you want to change the world? Believers who change the world are believers who are fully surrendered to Jesus Christ. In Damascus, Saul had time to think about all that happened on the road to the city. He was physically blind, but he was seeing more clearly than he had seen to that point. Saul had a decision to make. Would he become a follower of Jesus Christ, or would this be a, a one-time event with the Son of God? Saul's ledger. I think that Saul imagined a ledger, a spreadsheet. On one side, he listed elements of his pedigree. Circumcised on the eighth day, he was born a Jew. A Hebrew of Hebrews, he was a pure blood. Of the, of the tribe of Benjamin, he could, he could trace his roots back to his namesake, King Saul, the first Saul of his first king of Israel, and to David, the greatest king of Israel. He went on to list his achievements in his ledger. He, he was a Pharisee. He was the most legalistic, of the most legalistic sect of Israel's religious leaders. Concerning zeal, he was more than a Pharisee. He was a militant Pharisee. Concerning his qualities, as far as the outside public was aware, he was blameless before the law. And along with these credentials came family, friends, position, prestige, power, and honor. And on the other side of the ledger existed one entry, Jesus. Dear ones, I can't be sure when exactly Saul came to this conclusion, but when he wrote his letter to the Philippians, he made it clear. Everything that Saul had considered an asset in his life, everything that he had considered valuable, he now considers garbage, trash, refuse. From his days in Damascus until the end of his life, all that Saul wanted was Jesus. Give me Jesus and give me more of Jesus. I got to have more of Jesus. Listen to his own words. I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ. Come on. This is the man who is on his way to Damascus to bring back Christians to try them in Jerusalem and to have them killed if he could. And on the way there, he has an encounter with Jesus Christ and he understands this is God. He's Lord. I've got to surrender to him. And immediately a surrender takes place and everything that that man counted valuable, he says that is rubbish compared to knowing Jesus. Come on, friends. There's some of us, we've been walking with Jesus for 20 years, and we're not there yet. We've been walking with Jesus for decades, and we're not there yet. We're still monkeying around with stuff when all we need is Jesus. And when we understand that all we need is Jesus, then all we will want is Jesus. And then when we hear things about the coronavirus, we're not numbered among those clearing out all the toilet paper at Costco. Because we're not going to catch a panic. Because my life, my life is hemmed in by Jesus. He is intertwined with me. I'm a part of his family. And I'm here to live for Jesus. Paul got it. He got it in one afternoon on the way to Damascus. Come on, friends. We need to ask the Holy Spirit. Let me get it now. Let me do it now. That I might live my life out only for him. Are you fully surrendered to Jesus Christ? Let me tell you, when you're surrendered to Jesus, you know what you experience? You experience fullness. This life, this life, James said it best. He said it's like a vapor. It's like breathing in the cold air. You see it and then it's gone. The only way we're going to live a full life is if we hitch our lives to what's eternal. 
And there are only three things that are going to last for eternity. And that's the triune God, that's the word of God, and that's the souls of men and women. Those are the only three things that are going to last for eternity. We've got to hitch our lives to God. We've got to hitch our lives to the word of God. We've got to hitch our lives to bringing people into the kingdom. If you want a full life, if you want to be able to say at the end of the day, man, that was a good day. I'm tired, but it was a good kind of tired. When we surrender to him, we live a life of significance. Because whatever we do, be it in the school or in the marketplace or in the public square, when we're being directed by him, when we're doing the things he calls us to do within the context that he's placed us, when we make him, when we make him preeminent, then everything we do for him is significant. Now our life has significance. Paul said it this way, always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know your labor in the Lord is not in vain. I always close out a great side service with that scripture. And then I usually say something like this because it happens at most funerals that I preach. At the end, somebody, pastor, if I'm still around in this area and I die, I want you to preach my funeral because that was an amazing funeral. And then I tell them, I tell them the same thing over and over. Well, if you want me to preach a good funeral, you give me some good material. Live like this. Live like this. And your funeral will preach itself. Endurance. It's not so much what we do, but that we give our lives to Christ while we're doing it. Everything we do, we should do it as unto the Lord. And when we work that way, that means that we will be productive, kingdom-building disciples, whether we're engineers or builders, teachers, laborers, politicians. That's right, even politicians. If we live fully for him, we're going to endure. The things we do will have endurance and freedom. Being surrendered to Christ sets us free. Because when you surrender to Jesus, you step away from the crowd. No longer does the world direct. No longer does the world dictate. So I'm free. Saul, who was later known as Paul, became who he was created to be when he said yes to Jesus. That's when he became who the Lord had made him to be. What will your answer be to Jesus? Pastor Shannon, come back. I want to end with a part of the story that has application for all of us today. Those in the building, those watching online. And as I do, I'll explain those index cards. But three days after Saul entered Damascus, Jesus appears to a man named Ananias, one of Jesus' disciples. And the Lord tells Ananias, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. I can almost see Ananias' jaw drop as he listens to Jesus. He probably wanted to say something like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Have you not heard about this guy? He responded more respectfully. But he did remind Jesus of Saul's murderous activity against the church. And Jesus reassures him and lets him know, he says this, he is my chosen instrument to carry my name to the Gentiles. You go pray for him. In an astounding act of courage, Ananias pushes his reasonable fear aside and obeys Jesus. Another act of surrender. And 
Ananias goes to Saul, places his hands on that murderer, and prayed for him. The Bible says that immediately something like scales fell off of Saul's eyes. Saul, Paul, gets up, is baptized, <laughs> identifies himself as a follower of Jesus Christ, and goes preaching in the synagogue about the one who he thought he was going to snuff out. Ananias, act of obedience, led to the commissioning of the greatest missionary, evangelist, church planter the church has ever seen. Saul surrendered, Ananias surrendered, Saul obeyed, Ananias obeyed, and now a man whose abilities, zeal, and brilliant mind were in the hands of Satan. Now that man's abilities, that man's zeal, that man's brilliant mind is now in the hands of the Holy Spirit, and we thank him for writing two-thirds of the New Testament under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Friends, when we think someone is beyond hope and outside the possibility of coming to Jesus, we need to think about Saul. We need to think about that man and what the Lord did there. So, these index cards. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to take a few moments and write on that card somebody who you are very burdened for that you know needs Jesus. And perhaps somebody who at times you've thought, man, is he beyond Jesus' reach? And I'm going to tell you he's not. Now, you can say as much or as little because these are going to be prayed for. So you can either, depending on who you're putting on there, if you want to just put a first name, you could do that. You could put a first and second name. You could put a first and second name and what their relationship is to you. That's, what, that's what's going to be on my card because I want you to know who you're praying for. That's me. But you, you, you do whatever you feel like you want to do because then what we're going to do is we're going to close this service by as many of you as will fill these out. You're going to bring them. We're going to have the offering plates here on the platform. You're going to place them in those plates. And then this is what's been dropped in my heart. We're going to make these cards available every time the church is open for people to come in, be it before a service, after a service. You want to grab them, take them to the prayer room, and we are going to pray and believe for these individuals from now until Easter Sunday, and we're going to believe God for a harvest. We're going to believe God for a harvest. We're going to believe God to, to step into the lives of those individuals that at times we wonder, is there any hope? And believe God to bring them, her, to Jesus. So if you would just take a moment and do that, if there's someone that you're burdened for right now, if you need a little more time, of course you can do that. But I think most of us know. Most of us know because we've been praying for these individuals. So just jot those names down. And if those of you, there are some who do not have cards or papers. Can the ushers help me, please? There are some who did not get an index card or paper. If some of the ushers could please help me. And if you need one, just raise your hand and they'll serve you. Just raise your hand. They're coming. Thank you.
while you're doing that, I'm going to have you stand. Those of you who still need to rise, you can remain seated, but you others can stand if you're done. close our service, let's do a few things. I want to encourage you to come. If you fill out a card, place it on these places. Maybe you'll want to stay at these altars and pray for that individual before you leave this morning. If you absolutely have to go, the ushers will receive the cards in the back and they'll make sure that we have them and they'll be out every service and you'll be able to pray through those names and believe God for changes. So let me say these things, and then we want to open the altars. Perhaps you're a follower of Jesus Christ. You, you love the Lord. You're serving him. But it seems like the enemy is able to kind of take you back to something that happened in the past, some act, some misbehavior. And that thing, that thing hinders your walk with the Lord that thing gives you a sense of, of shame and, and guilt and somehow has restricted you from being all that Christ has made you to be. I read this recently that the question that we need to ask is, am I greater than Jesus? Well, of course, every follower of Christ would say, no way. Well, then if we're not greater than Jesus, and Jesus has forgiven us, then why wouldn't we forgive ourselves? We've got to forgive ourselves. He forgave us, we forgive ourselves. And that becomes the beginning of being freed from that shame, from that guilt that the enemy wants to manipulate in our lives. Secondly, you haven't surrendered your life to Jesus Christ? to know that you have someone who loves you like no one else will ever love you. He died for you to bring you into relationship with the Holy God. And if you've been resisting the advances of Christ's love in your life, I appeal to you today to surrender to his love, to respond to his love receive him as your savior, as your Lord, to say, I'm done, I'm done with living life on my terms, with no regard for my God. That's what sin is. And you receive him today. And then again, for those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, friends, we just need to be Ananias. We have just got to be an Ananias in somebody's life. God's work is to bring people to himself. Jesus will bring people to himself, but we have a job to do as well. We got to be Ananias. We got to go. We got to go and not lose hope in what the Lord can do in the life of that individual. So I'll pray. Pastor Shannon will help us. Prayer partners, you come for those who would like prayer. If you want to pray on your own, of course, there's always space at the altar for you to do that. And then I'll encourage you, as different ones are coming to pray, you can come in and you can slip by and place your card in the plate. If not, you can give it to somebody in the back. Father, again, we come to you in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God, for your love for us. Thank you for your grace, your mercy. Thank you that you did not give up on us. And thank you, God, that you don't give up on people. And that there is no one, there is no one outside of your reach. So, Father God, you've laid individuals on our hearts, and there are people that we have been interceding for and praying for, and we're believing, God, together, collectively, for harvest and for changes. And then, Lord, there are those in this body, Lord, those that, are, that, that, that have been struggling with something in their lives. They love you. They're pursuing you. But, God, the enemy has just been able to hold this over them. I pray in Jesus' name that today they'll be set free from that. And then for those here today that find themselves like Saul, kicking against your purposes, kicking against your love, oh God, I ask that today would be the day of salvation for them. Granted, we pray. Granted, we pray. 
in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. So as the team leads us, if you'd like to come for prayer, the prayer partners are here, you want to pray on your own, there's space at the altars, you want to just come and drop off that prayer card so we can pray together for these individuals, you do that. Pastor Shannon, thank you.